This just happened. Um, About a year ago, Erin and I went on our first Quincy trip. It was a fantastic time. Um, the morning we woke up in the Quincy, I told her that I loved her for the first time. She said it back. And it was just one of those perfect days where you're really content and uh, everything is amazing. That day turned into one of the biggest nightmares of our lives. Here we are. Um... We're on Catlinite now and we're trying to find a place to set up our Quincy. Getting there with the setup. Just a couple more things. <laughs> so, Aaron at the time was living in Geraldton. I was living in Marathon, about three and a half hours apart. We were winter camping in the Quincy, roughly in between and we would take a, a logging road in Northern Ontario called Catlinite Road to get to each other. It was the fastest way as opposed to going around on the Trans-Canada Highway. It took us about an hour each to get to back to cell phone signal. There was none on this uh, forestry road. Whenever we got back to signal, we had a system of checking in with one another to you know, say that we were safe and that no emergency action was needed obviously at that point. But if we ever didn't check in, then we knew that something might be wrong. And that was what happened on this day. Um, it was around zero, around the freezing mark, and road conditions were slushy. This is a gravel road packed with snow and, in this case, ice. Conditions weren't great, but we had done that drive all winter, going back and forth to each other's houses on the weekend. And uh, so I got back to the highway and texted Aaron. Didn't get a text back right away, but I, I figured that was okay. Didn't think much of it after a full winter of doing this. But um, I got home an hour later and she still hadn't texted me. And then an hour after that, she still hadn't texted me. And I was just sitting at home starting to stew. Shortly after that, I contacted Aaron's sister, Cassia, whose house we're at. She's eating breakfast over there. Say hi, Cass. Hello. We're at her house here in Thunder Bay, and uh, and Kess hadn't heard from her um, either. And so I contacted Aaron's friends in Geraldton, Brian and Lisa, and uh, Brian went to check your house mm -hmm. and the grocery store because I figured uh, Aaron might be getting groceries on the way home, and I was also thinking her cell phone might be dead, and that's why she hadn't contacted me. So I was hanging on to that sliver of logic that everything was okay, um, but. I was beginning, panic was, was setting in at this point. Um, and not to make it dramatic or anything, but uh, uh, around this, this point in the day, I was starting to melt down. I was crying and begging, and I, like, I knew something was wrong. Not on some cosmic emotional connection level, in a very logical level, I knew something was extremely wrong. Um, there was no way she would have gone that long without checking in and not have uh, been seen by friends or, or family. So I called the Ontario Provincial Police uh, and filed a report and just like that she was considered a missing person. You know, they, they saw the logic in what I told them as well so they didn't waste any time in declaring her a missing person. They said to stay put because they needed to be able to contact me. Uh, which was hard to do. I wanted to obviously drive up there, but then I wouldn't have cell phone signal. And then if Aaron gets to cell phone signal, I don't have cell phone signal to receive it. So it was a real dilemma. And they said just to let the cruiser do the uh, check. Um, and then Aaron, you tell uh, what you've been through by that point. Yeah, so we, we parted ways and um, it was just, it was below freezing, but it was a really nice, clear, warm day. It wasn't to like, I wasn't um, concerned about the road conditions. It just seemed like a nice day to be on the road, uh, which was a mistake, but um, cause it had been a couple of degrees above freezing the day before. So what had happened was, um, you know, things had started to melt and then 
when the temperatures dipped overnight, they froze into and it created some black ice. So very shortly after we parted ways, it was within 10 minutes. Um, I just was coming around a corner. It wasn't even, um, you know, a sharp corner, but uh, my truck <clears throat> just began to fishtail a little bit. And I remember, you know, don't don't slam on the brakes, try not to overcorrect, but it was really um, losing control. So I corrected a little bit and then it just completely swung the other way. And uh, and then I ended up going over into the bank and at this point in the winter, the snow banks were 10 feet high. Um, so I hit the snow bank and right before hitting the snow bank, I remember having the thought of it being really stupid that I didn't hit the brakes. <laughs> that seems silly. You do what you're supposed to. And yeah. It doesn't um, always save you. So I was, I wasn't going fast for that, you know, that road on a nice day, you'll drive 90, but I was going not over 70, but that was fast enough. I hit and, and rolled the truck. This just happened. Um, yeah, I just hit some ice and lost control. Hit the bank and went over. Um, it was pretty scary. My stuff's scattered in there. Luckily, I've got a lot of warm clothes. So I'm just gonna hang out. I'm still 60 miles from service. So. until someone comes this way. I knew I was on the road, but I didn't know where. I was upside down. So I was hanging in the truck upside down, on the road, came to a stop, still strapped in. I kind of did my quick check and I was- um, In one piece. In one piece, nothing major, big relief there. So I kind of composed myself and uh, unbuckled. And then the impact had, had squished the cabin enough that the doors wouldn't open. So next I was stuck in the truck and that was, that was really scary. It wasn't too long. It was a couple of minutes before I was able to, um, end up having to kick, kick the door out. Um, it opened up with some force, but it was a couple of minutes of being in the truck. It got very claustrophobic, very fast. And just on that road, I know people drive, um, without a lot of caution sometimes. Where you was, don't expect to run into people you, that often. And there yeah. are, are hauling trucks for logging. Yeah. Blazing down that road with full logs of load, loads full of loads log. of log. <laughs> yeah, so, um... Did you have your ice picks, uh, or your picks for the window at that point? Um, ironically, I did, I have one. I have one of those seatbelt cutters and, um, things for the, the, that will break the window, but it was for some reason at Barb's. I'd left it at my mom's. I'm not sure why. Uh, so it wasn't, but I did have a hammer in the back that I could have found if I needed to, but, mm -hmm. um... I ended up, yeah, kicking the, um, I remember trying with my hand just to break the windshield or one of the windows, which obviously didn't work, but, um, that was really scary of being stuck in the truck, being okay, and then worried about just getting, um, you know, having someone come around a corner and, and hit, hit me, so, uh, I knew I had to get out of there pretty quick, and I was able to do that after a couple minutes of panic, and then I got out. And uh, my stuff, I had my gear from camping in the box of the truck so I could see it scattered all across the, the bush. And again, I did a quick check, looked around, I was okay. And then it was this very surreal um, feeling of it's like, it's all the adrenaline and you're just heart racing the most. Yeah, it's this crazy adrenaline and then you get out of the truck, realize you're okay. And I was in just complete solitude. There was no one or nothing around no no one to call and say this just happened and it was very bizarre so i gathered my things i gathered some stuff for firewood just in case i had to start a fire later we had been camping the night before and mm -hmm. even without camping i always keep um a sleeping bag and boots and a parka just the kind of basics for if you do get stuck um so i gathered all that stuff and i i just hunkered down and i knew at that point i was okay and I was very thankful and my next thoughts were I knew John was, if no one came soon, gonna be worried and um, Cassie and my sister, we always have a system too when John and I are out. I tell her when to expect us and um, it was coming on, it was six o'clock was when I told her that. I think this, I can't remember what time of day, it was earlier in the afternoon but I knew 
before long that time would pass and she would worry. So yeah, I put got in my sleeping bag, put the park on, I just kinda hunkered down on the on the snowbank and waited for someone to drive by. For how long? And it, it ended up being three hours. No one drove by for three hours. Yeah. Which you know, this this is a remote road, but uh, usually at least a haul truck will come down. But it was a Sunday, so I guess mm -hmm. they weren't working. They weren't hauling. And, uh, yeah, and we actually Port commented waited three hours there in the cold earlier that day when we were out because we end up coming back and fishing kind of close to the road, and we were commenting how we hadn't heard any vehicles, and we're like, oh, this is so nice, we're close to the road, but no one's out today. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I was on the snowbank and. Um, Three, after three hours, there and there was a couple times the wind, it was so quiet that I was kind of there, not just relaxing, and um, the wind would blow past and it almost sounded like a vehicle, so I'd get my hopes up and pop oh. up and, and no one came, and so, but then when a truck finally did come, it wasn't until it was quite close that I looked. So the poor, there was these two gentlemen in the truck that were just out for a Sunday drive and found me and... Um, Who used to haul... That they, route, right? Yeah. yeah, they were truckers on that route, just, <laughs> just out for driving their old route. Nostalgia, and uh, and so I, they came around the corner and saw a truck flipped, and and just someone lying on the snowbank. So they thought it was they were mortified, and you know they got pretty close before they saw any movement, and then all of a sudden they saw me kind of shuffle, and by this point I was a little bit groggy because I was having a nap, and uh, and you were concussed. Yeah, and I had a concussion, so. Um, they drove up and they saw me and they were hopped on. Oh my God, are you okay? And I kind of popped up. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And they're like, are you sure? <laughs> they're, they're, like, like, are you sure? Like you're, it doesn't you, look like it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, no. I'm like, oh, I'm like, where are you guys heading? Can I get a ride? <laughs> so, uh, they the drove ultimate me, trooper as always, every scenario drove me back. But again, it was still another hour drive until we got to cell phone service. So, um, mm -hmm. it was at least four hours for John of waiting, thinking, worrying about, yeah. It was four, four and a half hours before I was back in service. My phone was close to dead. I only had 1%, 1 or 2%. So I was just hoping that it would um, stay. Because again, if it died, I would have to wait. It'd be another hour until we got home to be able to plug it in and contact him. So mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it, I got a ride out with those guys and we drove home, called John, called Kess. And, uh, called the police. Called the police. The hospital. So I ended up, I was really, really lucky in that. I, I did have a concussion. I was, did concussion protocol for about a week of living like a mushroom and uh, staying in the light. dark with no screen time. But otherwise I was not harmed. So. A bit of whiplash. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the moment that we decided to buy an SOS button. Also uh, more formally called a, a PLB or a personal locator beacon. We just call it the SOS button. For a long time I had resisted buying one or being connected whatsoever on trips. There's like the Garmin InReach and all the other ones spot and I refused to bring one because I didn't want the thought of being connected or having the expectation back home that I was going to check in, uh, which is probably overconfident because you never know what can happen and uh, I really believe that now. I think I was younger and more naive at the time and uh, you think you're invincible and actually things had happened to me before that should have made me want to get one but it wasn't until something happened to Aaron that you know, I really felt the need because I thought if something ever happened on a, on a trip to her and I cheaped out and refused to spend 400 bucks on this little device um, and it you know had some any kind of a ramification like from ranging from you're uh, prolonging your suffering to uh, someone losing their life. Um, that just became not an option anymore. So we spent the money right away. Sorry, Finn. Finn, Finn. One sec, buddy. Yeah. One sec. I gotta get something. Finn's old. Very old. So old. Oh, so we got this Rescue Link PLB. This one is just an SOS button. You can set off the antenna and then there's a test button and then there's a real emergency button um, which calls in a pretty serious response it might be the Canadian military coming in so uh, not to be used lightly but in life or death uh, it's very nice to have that peace of mind Aaron got uh, we got lucky there we got really lucky 
um, you know, if, if it would have been anything more serious, if I couldn't have gotten out of the truck or if I was actually had a serious injury and, you know, had to be on that road for, um, in that condition for that amount of time, it, it could have been a different story. So the fact, you know, mm -hmm. um, the fact that I was unharmed and I was able to just hunker down and wait for help was really fortunate, but, um, yeah, if there was any injury, it could have been very different. So, and we hadn't even thought of a PLB for that drive prior to that. We were a little bit. No, um, that wasn't why. It, was... <laughs> it hadn't crossed our mind. We were no, kind of thinking about maybe for thinking trips, about maybe. for spring, yeah, and mm -hmm. um, for wilderness trips. But it really opened our eyes to just the number of things that can go wrong that um, you don't anticipate. Yes, exactly. And then it's not going to be. It may not be a broken leg or. Um, whatever medical it can just be a complete accident that's not yeah. what you expect to happen um and then so on our trip in may that we did our ice out trip where we did uh, a bit of an exploratory trip that one i was really really thankful to have it because i realized how um any small thing that trip was so hard and and physically demanding it wouldn't have been possible to complete with you know maybe a rolled ankle but anything more serious than that and we were, at times, I think at the furthest, we were three days from, three hard days from getting back to cell phone service. Mm -hmm. And if one of us couldn't continue, we didn't have two sets of gear. We didn't have two tents or anything like that, right? If, if one of us did get seriously mm -hmm. injured, broke a leg, up. we would have had to split up and leave the injured person in, in place and, to go, and for help. go find help. And then completing, even completing that route with just one person. Mm -hmm. would have been a challenge like if you got injured and I had to get out of there with all my own just I could have done it but it might have taken an extra couple of days splitting up the food it just mm -hmm. wouldn't have been good so no. um, even a trip like that we we're really happy to have it and you had your uh, boot fiasco then too so yeah could have easily like you easily could have broken an ankle yeah 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 she had no grip on her shoe. The soles came right off of both yeah. of her boots. It was like being in um, bowling shoes. Mm -hmm. It was so bad. There was a couple times there it was, we joked about pressing it because of emotional distress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh... And then I, later in the season, uh, that was at the start of the season, at the end, another uh, shoulder season trip. I was really glad to have this because um, I was on the Little Pick River and not only was it uh, a difficult trip, but I was worried about Aaron calling in help, um, which wasn't, wasn't necessary. And uh, in that instance, I actually wish I did have one that had communication abilities. Like you can just send a text. Some of them you can have pre-programmed texts like I'm okay or I'm running late. Don't worry. I'm just going to be another day or two. Um, and that would have been nice there, but usually I'm, not, I'm better at estimating the amount of time necessary for a trip. Uh, so I don't normally think that's necessary for me, but I would consider it next time. But uh, for now, this is something that's nice to have. There was another trip um, three years ago or so. I passed a kidney stone, um, which was as painful as they say. And I've always worried since uh, if, if you, once you pass a kidney stone or if you do, you're more likely to pass one again in the future. And I think if, uh, if that happened to me on a trip, it would be hell. <laughs> I had, uh, there were three people there when I, uh, when I passed the kidney stone or started coming on with the symptoms and, uh, Marissa, Jeremy and Mike, uh, I'm forever indebted to those people. Uh, Marissa really helped me, uh, take care of me when I was starting to feel it. And then Mike and Jeremy took me to the hospital. Uh, where I was writhing around in the ground in pain. Uh, and I, yeah, since then I've got to thinking if that happened on a trip. We also thought it was more likely appendicitis at the time. You know, I was 29 years old. I didn't expect to have a, a kidney stone. The battery's about to die. Tuna! And Finn, are you going to be the star of our video? You're going to see who's that charming cat? battery ran out <laughs> yeah. so that's about it mm -hmm. um, that was the moment for us that made us get one of these it was 
terrifying, awful, I never want to go through it again without uh, us having help. Yeah, no, we got really lucky and happy ending to that story, but uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we don't have to go through it again. But if we, you know, it really opened our eyes to the need, potential need for having access to a PLB. Mm -hmm. Bye. Oh, now that's a sharp claw. Hmm? Mr. Sharp Claw? Can you stretch? Can you stretch those legs? Oh yeah, that's good.